Good morning, everyone. <laughs> it's good to see you all. It's great to have Rob and Lindsay with us again this morning. They really are a wonderful part of this house. Um, and Rob's going to be sharing some of his thoughts with us in just a few minutes. It's great to have so many different contributing ideas as we walk this journey. So thank you very much, Rob, for all that you bring. Um, now, I know we weren't here last week, but a few weeks back, um, I did a talk about emotions with Claire um, and their roles and what part they play within our lives. Now, in my conclusion, I had mentioned right at the end that I'd recently been feeling a bit of an irrational fear of death. Now, we'd run out of time, um, and I wasn't able to kind of quantify and explain a little bit of where I was um, on my personal journey. Um, but in a way, it's kind of helped because it sparked a thought in me. I was able to take that away, and I found that I've been really birthing some new ideas within that process. And I think sometimes, um, sometimes you can get a tiny little thing that comes to you, and you need to sit on that and and think about it, and I found that I've really enjoyed the process over the last two weeks, coming to some new ideas. Now, some of you may not know, but last year, um, I lost someone who was very close to me within the family, um, at a very young age, um, in a tragic accident, um, and it came as a, as a real shock. Now, whilst it's perfectly reasonable to be faced with various emotions caused by such an event, this is now connected to various other historical feelings of loss and hurt, this, along with various health concerns that I've had recently, has led me to quite a sad place. Now, as I mentioned in my talk, these emotions are not necessarily untrustworthy and maybe saying something to me. But when I step back and revise, the feelings I have are coming more from the habitual thought process that I have put in place to deal with the trauma rather than the actual event itself. Much of not all, if not all, of what I am feeling at the moment bears no relation to my present reality. I have had to step back and ask, is what I'm feeling a rational conscious response to reality or a subconscious reaction to my faulty evaluations? And it's been quite an interesting process. And it hit me. It's not so much that I am afraid of death, but rather the complexities of life. <laughs> just to be honest, but that's been a, a real revelation. <laughs> okay, so this is just kind of a summary of, of where I'm at. So on a theological and spiritual level, I realized I had moved into dualistic thinking. If it is true we are in a Christ-soaked universe, that the kingdom is within, in all and through all, that all things are being redeemed, that hope enables there to be more to the story, then my fear is coming from a fragmented understanding of my place in the cycle of Christ. The whole concept of Jesus' death and resurrection was about shattering the illusion of death. Jesus said at the Last Supper, I say these things so that my joy may be within you and be made complete. Or here's another one, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. God is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. Offer all your anxieties to God that a peace which surpasses all understanding will guide your heart and your mind. Give thanks in every situation because this is God's will for you. In the words of the song Becoming, which I'll be singing later on, I am miles from where I was, yet so far from where I want to be. With each day, I learn to trust the maker is still making me. It's progress, not perfection, not arrival, it's direction, not the finish line, but the journey. I'm coming to the understanding, I'm 40 now. <laughs> Life is short, but it's for living, and it's the, uh, in the most joyous way possible. Now, as we listen to Rob this morning, I pray that we will all find the strength to release the resistance that holds us back from being all we are made to be and experience a joy that overcomes. So this is the emerging tradition when I tell a story about myself that paints me in a bad light. <laughs> Quite a few years ago, I was working on a project and we had a new head of the project come in and he took me to the cafe and he said to me, you are in my kingdom, and I am the king. And in, yeah. <laughs> and in an act of great Christian maturity, 
and an act of passive aggression, I created a persona around him of Elvis, the, the true king. <laughs> and this culminated in a big planning meeting where I had printed out the whole anthology of Elvis songs and we'd agreed, a whole bunch of us, to get as many of those songs into the meeting as we possibly could. <coughs> and if we would normally say yes, to say, uh-huh, instead. <laughs> now, this guy wasn't the kind of guy to notice, but one of my colleagues, who was right, said to me, this is unprofessional, and I don't want any part of it. And so we went in anyway, and uh, it, it, was a fun, it was a fun meeting. Right at the end, that colleague said, I've just got something to say before we break up. He goes, you know, we just can't go on together like this with suspicious minds. <laughs> and for me, he passed into legend. <laughs> and suspicious minds is where we're going to start. Is it just me or, or has Anth worn that shirt. <laughs> so in, in the best tradition of Q, I bit off way more than I could chew. And that rhymes as well, doesn't it? Just realized. <laughs> 10 books later, 10 books later, whole load of papers, hours of YouTube video, here I am with too much to say, which doesn't always make for a good talk, but I'll, I'll try. But I've been on a journey myself, and I'm hoping I can convey a little bit to you. And you can make up your own mind, because where I've ended up is a weird place that I did not expect. But in the end, you have to follow it through, and that's what I've done. In fact, there was a point when I was going to bed with Freud. I was in the bath with A.C. Grayling. <laughs> I was having lunch with Peter Rollins and spending afternoon moments with Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Yeah, I've, ne I've never, I've never, uh, I like Kierkegaard actually, maybe next time, maybe next time. So, maybe we could have the slides up. Right. This is a, I'm afraid, it's a failure because here's the real thing. And this is how far I got. Maybe you can't see that from there, uh, but this is supposed to be that. And the clues in the name, they're called nano blocks, and uh, they're very small. And we've invested, what, two or three hours in it? That's how far I got. I decided life was too short. So there's a picture, <laughs> there's a picture of what it would have looked like. And I think one way to look at the quest is to say, which blocks in the faith house that is our heritage, which blocks are authentic faith and which blocks are human religion? Now, it's not actually as easy to do, and it's interesting what you learn by trying to physically do it, because some of the blocks are trapped inside other blocks, it's really hard to get at them. And so this isn't an easy journey. And also, I don't want to give the impression that it's a purely intellectual thing. I think for most of us, that's not where the quest starts. The quest starts with a, a dissonance, a feeling of unease, or a crisis that causes us to question. It's actually a really visceral thing. It's not just that we wake up one morning and have an intellectual insight. And sometimes the quest gets out of our control. I think for most of us, it eventually gets out of our control. So how do we go about figuring out which blocks are which? I can't see Danny. There he is, because I can't see anyone. <laughs> this is all Danny's fault what's happened here. Danny sent me a link to um, Atheism for Lent. And I started, I started a journey, which was not quite that journey, but it, it began with that. And so I'm going to begin by 
looking at what a few prominent atheists can tell us about religion, because it's really quite instructive. Can we have the next slide? You might have thought that we recently reached peak beard, <laughs> but it wasn't the first time. It wasn't the first time. That's Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. Let me tell you in a nutshell what they thought and what could be interesting about what they said um, in our quest. Marx, his big theory is that society is driven by class struggle and religion is a tool of control. Now, there's a complication to his theories as we look back in history because actually his proposals are very similar to a religious system. And the communism that he inspired has been just as repressive, violent, and abusive as the worst forms of religion. But I still think he leaves us with a lingering important question. How much is religion really a form of repression, control, and spiritual abuse? And which blocks in the house does that tell us we should disconnect and throw away? The next one's Nietzsche. If you're old enough, he does bear a resemblance to Mr. Rusty off, uh, off the magic roundabout, doesn't he? <laughs> he does, but Mr. Rusty didn't have quite the same philosophical point of view. Um, so, Nietzsche's big theory was that superhumans should self-realize without having to resort to ideas about God or the soul or anything outside of ourselves. He argued that beliefs were actually meaningless and our moral values were human traditions. Now, the complication is that that, uh, that must apply to his own theories and the historical angle is a distortion of his theory. It's quite important uh, to note that because often this bit is missed out. Um, his sister was instrumental in taking his views, which came to be um, one of the underpinnings of, of the Nazis. Uh, but it, it was not really his views, and he was actually anti-fascist. But he does leave us with a lingering question that still relevant today. How much do we abdicate to God the responsibility that we should take for action? And do we confuse human customs with divine morality? And then finally, Freud. Freud's big theory was that our true motivations are influenced by unconscious memories, thoughts, and urges. That means we don't truly know our own motivations. On religion, he considered religion to be an illusion, some form of wish fulfillment, and a way of not facing into the complexities and realities of life. Now, the complication for him is that having put forward his theories as scientific, scientists asked whether they really were at all, and I think generally it's now considered that there's no evidence for them. And Jung, who followed him, saw religion actually as a positive and healthy expression of, of, the, of the collective unconscious. But here's Freud's lingering question of relevance. To what extent is religion wishful thinking, self-deception, false certainty, and a way of not facing our fears? To that extent, we should, to the best of our ability, detach those blocks and throw them away. 
Collectively, those three are called the masters of, of suspicion. And that's why um, we've had suspicious minds. But I think they motivate us to identify religious abuses of power, holy inaction, human rule-making, wishful thinking, and, and, and uh, self-deception from our own faith journeys. But doesn't it make you wonder, maybe just all religion is rotten? And if it is, why don't we just get rid of all of it? And in the next section, I'm going to talk about people who've tried to take all of the religion out of faith and where that's ended up. But next, let's have a little bit more Elvis. So the masters of suspicion give us a challenge. But I have to say, I didn't find it that difficult to brush off some aspects of their challenge because they themselves are somewhat discredited by history and by subsequent thinkers. But where I ended up on the edge of reality myself and the 10 books and all the rest of it was when I came into our current culture and had a great talk from Jenny on culture not long ago, looking at the way we are beginning to think now. And that presented to me a much, much bigger challenge. But let me thread it together. So this idea of getting rid of religion from Christianity started, you can argue where it started, but definitely religious, uh, religionless Christianity. Could we have the slide, actually, please? That's a very cool picture, isn't it? It's not the one I want, but it's, it's very cool. If we could just go on one. There we go. That's Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And that's a statue of him in Berlin. Um, he was executed by the Nazis just before the end of the war. Uh, but in a, in a letter from prison in, in 1944, he introduced the idea of religionless Christianity. And he said this, are there religionless Christians? If religion is only a garment of Christianity, and even this garment has looked very different at different times, then what is a religionless Christianity? He wanted to re-describe all the central themes of Christianity because he didn't believe that they meant anything to people outside of the church. And he said this, it'll be a new language, perhaps quite non-religious, but liberating and redeeming, as was Jesus' language. It'll shock people. Because what really bothered Bonhoeffer was that people were articulating all the right doctrine, they were doing all the practices of the church, and they were failing, up, failing to stand up to the Nazis. They became actually complicit in one of the most evil regimes that there's ever been. And he was about to be executed for standing up, and he therefore concluded that all that religion was utterly worthless in the face of a test. He was executed before he could develop his theory, but he considered it would consist of only two things. Prayer, by which he meant private prayer, and righteous action, doing things that change the world for the better. That was his vision of religious, religionless Christianity. But that's as far as he got. If we move into our present day, Peter Rollins, who some of you will have come across, I'm guessing, um, has taken up the mantle, and he cites Bonhoeffer as an inspiration. Rollins grew up in Belfast during the Troubles, and so he has seen religion as its most toxic. He is a compelling, creative, provocative storyteller. He is an amazing um, critic of institutionalized religion, and he's actually very funny. In fact, I'm going to tell you one of his jokes. <clears throat> 
three people die on the same day. The first is a mystic who goes to heaven, spends four hours with Jesus, comes out and says, how can I have been so wrong? But goes to heaven anyway. Second one, Catholic priest, four hours in with Jesus, comes out, how, how can I have been so wrong? And goes to heaven. And then the fundamentalist goes to heaven six hours in with Jesus. Jesus comes out and says, how can I have been so wrong? <laughs> so we like him, it's funny. He calls us essentially to embrace the power of doubt, confronting our fears and the contradictions between, um, in life and religion. He is interested in what he describes as burning down the traditional structures of religion. And he did have, for a while, a kind of leaderless um, expression of this in Belfast called Icon. It closed in 2022, but they were involved in meditation and transformative art. But there's an um, online community that I've been a part of for a couple of months, and it, it's been really, really interesting. And this sounds very like the quest of Q, I think. But, and this is where I started to feel like the falling Elvis. If you begin to look very, very closely at Rollins' work, He's really moved from religionless Christianity to godless community, which was not Bonhoeffer's vision. He still talks about resurrection, crucifixion, and Jesus, but he doesn't mean the historical events or any real people. They're all metaphors for our experience. He interprets Jesus' crucifixion as the death of God, and he, I think, rightly invites us to reflect on Jesus' sense of abandonment on the cross. But he never gets to the resurrection. He describes the resurrection as the very act of living fully in the darkness. So for Rollins, there's never a moment when Jesus says, I'm the living one, I was dead, and look, I'm alive forever and ever. That moment never comes in his work. So for Rollins, God is permanently dead. And what comes in God's place is community. He writes this. God is the name we give to the way of living in which we experience the world as worthy of living for, fighting for, and dying for. Can I just say, no one accident, oh, can we just go back one, please, sorry, and another one. No one accidentally takes that pose. <laughs> <laughs> just as a point. You, you don't find yourself doing that, do you? <laughs> so what starts as Rollins trying to take on the mandate of a religionless Christianity turns into, if we could have the next slide, please, if we could just go back. Community is God. So now there's no being. There's no other. The community is God for Rollins. And for me, opinion warning, for me that is a religious construct that simply has nothing behind it. It's a facade of language that has no underlying reality. Some of you might be really comfortable with that. I'm not there, um, and I'm not the only one. If, if we finally get to that slide that's just desperate to show itself, there we go. <laughs> the death of God, this is John Caputo, who ironically Rollins draws on extensively. It says, today Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud are all dead, but God's doing just fine, thank you very much, and still the source 
of a very great deal of trouble. Somehow, killing God hasn't been quite as easy as everyone predicted. The masters of suspicion thought it would be all over within a few years because their theories would replace the need for God. Rollins has, in a very complex way, removed God from the equation, and yet, somehow, God seems to survive this process. And at the heart of godless religion is a dark void. My sense is that that's just nothing like Q. I just don't, I don't sense that kind of nihilism at the heart of this community. And so it's a perfectly valid way of looking at the world. And it's a well-attested point of view, and I'm not suggesting otherwise. It just doesn't, for me, correlate with what I feel when I'm here. I feel there's an optimism about the world, about the journey, about the future, about human potential that exists here that doesn't feel like a dark void of meaninglessness. And so I would just say, and if you, if you want to go there, of course you can, and it's a, a legitimate place to live. But I don't think we have to exchange religion for nothingness. I don't think that's an exchange that's necessary. I think we can go another way. And to sing about that is Elvis Presley. <laughs> so things are already weird, and then they took a weirder turn in my own little journey that's led up to today. Just as atheists had taken me into the void, Weirdly, it was atheists that took me out of it. It seems that while theologians have been busy deconstructing God to within an inch of his life or maybe even further, atheists have been learning to appreciate religion, which sounds really quite ridiculous. But in his best-selling book, Religion for Atheists, Alan de Botton, you have to be careful how you say that, um, applauds religion for practical wisdom, a vibrant community, encouragement to kindness, a sense of perspective, and artistic creativity. Apparently, two comedians in London formed a thing called the Sunday Assembly, which is a non-theistic church, and now there's 40 of them around the world. They look just like churches, but they don't have a core of theistic belief. They're actually atheists. What is going on? There's Mr. De Botton. If we could have the next slide, please. You see, it's possible that people like me, and maybe some of you, have been a little bit barking up the wrong tree. Anth was hoping for some heresy, here it comes. <clears throat> because it could be, it could be that there's some things that we lump in with the term religion that we're actually deeply wired for in addition to the toxic mess that we described at the beginning. And it could be that trying to get rid of religion in total is a bit like trying to get rid of music from the world. It just it can't be done because somehow it's intrinsic to us. Christian Smith, who is a sociologist, argues that humans are moral believing animals who've exhibited religious behaviors throughout the whole of history. Even many atheists acknowledge that there's a human bias towards religion. So what does this mean to people like us? Well, I think it might mean that there's some blocks we need to really get rid of, and really quite a lot of them. But maybe there's some blocks that get lumped in 
that we need to keep or even build or maybe paint a different color. But maybe there's something in there that we need to be mindful of. David DeSteno is a neuroscientist and he has proved that certain forms of religion are good for us. And his angle is religions have created rituals. Now, before you all go at the word ritual, he just means special things we do together. He says the rituals of religion, he calls them religious technologies, help us on the journey of life because they help us mark things, they help us cope with things, <clears throat> they help us connect with one another to do life together. I was at a baptism last week and in the, in the Church of England, as, as I'm sure many of you know, the parents and sometimes the godparents say something, but then the congregation says, we will help. Of course, because it's the Church of England, it's, we will help this long. But that's what they're saying. We will help. We're a part of this too. So maybe religion's got a bright side, and I can't bring myself to say that I think we need more religion, but I think we need more something or to hang on to something. Maybe it's community or community, as I know you call it here. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe there's some spirituality that we do together somehow that's important that you can't do on your own. Matthew Guest is a researcher, and he looked at churches a little bit like Q. Of course, there's no church that's like Q, but decentered de churches, he called them. And he looked at them and said that churches like this have problems with durability and identity after they leave fundamentalism. And they usually die not because people disagree, but because the connectivity that holds the people together weakens participation reduces, and they die of a slow puncture. And so what he says is this. These are just his thoughts. But let's make them our thoughts. He says, keep sermons and talks. Well, you've done that brilliantly, except for the weeks I'm here. He says... <laughs> He says, and this is interesting, develop sustainable and meaningful rituals of connectivity and engagement. I'm thinking of your discussion weeks. You know, weeks where you are engaged together in that collective way. The social activities. We've signed up to that thing in the garden, by the way. So we'll see you there. We'll see you there, yeah. He says, offer extensive support networks. And then he, he finally says, promote a movement from identity and religious doctrine, which you've already done, to practical religious expression, which is basically doing good things together for other people. And I heard Jenny talk about, is Q a beacon to people experiencing the same sort of quest on their own? You were for me. Is there a group that religious institutions won't touch? Is that something to think about? I don't know, and it certainly isn't my place to tell you. But maybe there's a practical expression that binds people together because they're doing something for a cause outside themselves. 
I don't know. But what I do know is even though I think Peter Rollins has lost God, I think what he says about community is still true. A way of living in which we experience the world as worthy of living for, fighting for, and dying for. There's a passion in there about being a community together, doing something of significance. And I'll take that from his thinking every day of the week. So, we certainly need less religion in all the horrible, toxic ways that our atheist friends, past and present, have helped us to see. But maybe there's a core of something good that we can call a different name, that we can find and grow and develop together to make our life together even more meaningful in a world where it's not just about a rigidity of dogmatic belief. But for now, Elvis has left the building. Thank <laughs> you.